Continuing our, our series in the book of Ecclesiastes, we have gone uh, now two messages, covered the first chapter, and we are moving on into the second chapter. And to start out chapter two, I want you to imagine just for a second the song Imagine. This is John Lennon's greatest hit, uh, not with the Beatles, but solo career. He and his wife, Yoko Ono, wrote Imagine in 1971 and recorded it in May of the same year. Undoubtedly, whether or not you are above 50 like I am, or you are fairly young, this is a song that's, that's been played and played and re-recorded by many, many artists. It's a fairly popular song in the Western culture. Here's one of the verses from that song. Lennon says, imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us, only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Ecclesiastes basically calls his bluff and says, okay, I'll imagine, and that's what we are going to be doing for the next 15 weeks as we go through these 50 weeks, 15 weeks of Ecclesiastes. Here's the thing. When there is only sky above us, then we're left to look for meaning under the sun. Make sense? If that's it, if we are to imagine, or if reality dictates that there is only the material universe, there's nothing transcendent, then the best you and I can do is try to find meaning under the sun. And that's what the book of Ecclesiastes is doing. The book of Ecclesiastes is making an attempt to try to derive meaning in this life when there isn't anything transcendent. So what happens, what happens when there isn't anything transcendent and all the answers to life's big questions are meaningless? Big questions. What's your origin? Your origin is you descended from germs. You're an accident. What's your purpose? There isn't a purpose. You, there is no purpose. What's your destiny? You rot. That's it. I mean, the... Fairly, fairly depressing, is it not? So if those are the big questions. So if, you can't, if there aren't any answers to the big questions, to try to live a life which is full and rich and full of meaning, you have to go to lesser uh, temporal issues and you'd have to try to find meaning and pleasure. Eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. How many of you heard that? That's the essence of that. You're all going to rot, so the best you can do is just enjoy today. Chapter 2 is an attempt to try to derive and squeeze meaning out of life exclusively from pleasure. So it's a, it's, it's a result of imagining there's only sky above us. So if that's the case, you've got to look to pleasure. And chapter 2 is an attempt to do that. We're going to look at three things this morning. His quest... His quest, how he tried to derive meaning just from pleasure alone, what he found, the outcome, and then thirdly, uh, the hope. Where's the hope? You're going to see a pattern. Every week, it's going to be like, are you kidding me? This is the most depressing book I've ever read. And we are going to end with hope. We're going to end with hope. Let me read just a few verses. We will cover more than this, but a few verses from chapter 2, and then let's pray. Verse 9 through 11. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure. For my heart found pleasure in all my toil. And this was my reward for all my toil. And then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expanded or expended in doing it. And behold, it's all vanity, a striving after the wind. And there's nothing to be gained under the sun. Father, we ask that as we explore this text, that we would gain something, that we would gain wisdom, that we would gain perspective, and that we would walk away from here not with meaninglessness, but with joy, with purpose, with life. And Father, that doesn't come apart from your Holy Spirit. Uh, we don't imagine that there's only sky above us. 
We know that the reality, the truth of the matter is, is that you created the sky and everything under it, and everything that moves and lives has breath. Anything that is, you made it. So, Father, we are looking for our meaning, not from stuff, but from you. But, Lord, we need your Holy Spirit to help us connect the dots here in the Scripture to show us where we need to trust you and how to find meaning. So help us to do that, and may Christ be glorified this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, here we go. Let's jump into it. He starts out by giving you essentially the thesis of chapter 2 and the conclusion in the first two verses. And then through the rest of the chapter, he's going to, to, to expound on that. But here's the thesis. I said in my heart, come now, I'll test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. So that's, that's the experiment. That's what he's going to do. He's going to tell us how he did that in chapter 2. That's the experiment. But behold, this also is vanity. I said of laughter, it's mad, and to pleasure, what's the use? So he tells us what, he's going, what he concludes at, at the beginning. He says, this is what I tried to do, and this is what I found out. But he knows you're not going to take his word for it. Because I guarantee you, even if a credible source said, here's the thing, pleasure won't give your life meaning, you're thinking, yeah, but I have some ideas about that. I have some endeavors that I'd like to push through and see if I could test that theory myself. He knows that, and so that's why the rest of the chapter exists. He's going to tell you about his exploratory journey to try to derive meaning from pleasure. So let's take a look at the quest, what he tested. I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom. Apparently, he was not Baptist. And how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven, heaven during the few days of their life. Essentially what he did here is he recognized that there are certain things in life, wine in particular, that can change your brain chemistry to help you be cheered, if you will, to take the edge off, to take the edge off. Now this is not simply about alcohol consumption. By the way, this is, he's not advocating here. He's not saying, so I went on a binge and I just went crazy. No, he says, my heart was still guiding me with wisdom. In other words, he was restrained in his consumption, but nonetheless, it was, it was for, uh, for the altering of his brain chemistry so that he could experience life in a more positive way. And this is not just an alcohol thing. Our culture right now, uh, there are more, and by the way, I'm not, this is not a, I'm not rendering judgment, I'm just expressing what is fact, that uh, increasingly more and more and more and more and more people are being prescribed anti-anxiety, anti-depressant, uh, antidepressants and so forth so that they could uh, be cheered to be lifted out of a state of depression, to be lifted out of a state of anxiety so they can function and, 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 and function in life better. That Solomon's not different. He's not different. He's just taking the quote-unquote antidepressant of his age. I know some of you are going to say, well, alcohol is a depressant. True enough, true enough. But the purpose is he's trying to cheer his heart, trying to cheer his heart. And many of you uh, have, have gone down this same path. You're in pain for various reasons. You're anxious for various reasons. And so you've attempted, you've attempted to, to use a substance, alcohol, drugs, legal or otherwise, food, any number of things to try to comfort yourself and, and to take the edge off, to take the edge off. Uh, that's one route that he chose. Verse four, I made great works. I made great works. I built houses. I planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks. I planted them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. Now, some of you are thinking, oh, philanthropy. He's, he's trying to make his community better. No, this is not about the community. Notice there's a repeating phrase that occurs three times in those verses. For myself. This is not about bettering Jerusalem. This is not about bettering Israel. These are personal hobbies that he has undertaken to try to give himself more pleasure. Now, many of you will relate to this. You have a creative bent. You like to work with your hands. Some of you are woodworkers. You're carpenters. Some of you are builders. Some of you are entrepreneurs. You love to start things 
You love to start things. You love to build them from scratch. And it, you derive pleasure from the building of those businesses, the building of, 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 of materials. Some of you love to, love to work in, in, in the garden and, and manicure your lawn. How many of you lawn freaks are there? You love that, right? Solomon's not different. He just has more jack than you do. He's got a bigger lawn, a much bigger lawn. He's got orchards and gardens and so forth. And, and, and that's, that's what he's doing here. That's what he's doing. And, and many of you are, are the same. I moved into a, condo, into a condo in 2015. I haven't mowed since. I'm not that guy. Some of you are. I'm not. I'm not. But nonetheless, he's looking for meaning there. He made great works. Verse 7. I bought male and female slaves. I had slaves who were born in my house. I also had great possessions of herds and flocks more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. What he's saying here is he had unprecedented wealth. Unprecedented wealth. Now, I have to address this because there's a good chance there's many people who are struggling right now with the fact that he had slaves. A couple things, a couple things. Number one, this is not exactly the same type of slavery that you think of when you think of transatlantic slave trade where you would see free people taken from their homes and then sold into slavery. This is not that. Uh, it's, it's more indentured servanthood, but, but it's, it's still not good. It's still not good. And some people will read this and they'll think, I don't understand why is the Bible condoning this. Understand that Ecclesiastes is not prescriptive. It's descriptive. Do you know the difference? Prescriptive is the Ten Commandments. This is how you should live. Ecclesiastes is Solomon saying, this is what I did. He's not saying, oh, and you too should oppress and own people. He's just telling you, I did this so I could find some pleasure. And that's what people do. You use people to, 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 to get pleasure. Don't tell me you've never used anybody to get pleasure. We manipulate people. We use people. It's the same thing, only he has more of them. He has more of them. This might be translated in modern terms in terms of like, I, I, I started with a business. I had five employees. I built that sucker, and now I've got 120. In other words, I had more and more people under my authority working for me to increase my bottom end. That's what he's saying here. And in other words, this is, this is what he is hoping. As he acquires this wealth, he's hoping that the acquisition of this wealth is actually going to bring him pleasure, and that pleasure is going to give his life meaning. So this is, he had unprecedented wealth. Many of you relate to that. You're working to build your 401k. You're working to get ahead so you can retire. You're working all of these things. You're toiling, you're toiling, and toiling, and you're using that wealth. Your hope is in wealth. Your hope is in wealth. Oh, Jesus too. Right, of course. Right. That goes without saying, but, but really it's wealth. Really it's wealth. And then in verse 8 here, I also gathered for myself silver and gold in the, uh, the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the sons of man. So seven talks about the acquisition of wealth for the sake of wealth. Eight says, now I'm going to t acquire wealth, and I'm going to buy pleasure with the wealth. So they're different. There are some people who the acquisition of wealth is important to them, and that's where they derive meaning, but they don't spend it a lot. There are other people who they get money, and they're going to use it. They're going to buy toys, and they're going to have fun, and that's what he's talking about in verse 8. He didn't have Spotify, but he bought male and female singers so they could just follow him around and sing. <laughs> Imagine, you know, you put your iPhone on, you get, you know, you're, you're going for a jog, and you're listening to that. He just has a choir running around behind him. <laughs> Wherever he goes, he's got music. He's got music. I doubt that's reality, but that's the way I like to pretend it was. So... And then he not only had that, but he also had many concubines. If this is in fact Solomon, and, and tradition says that it is, he had a thousand wives and concubines. That's staggering. That, that, that type of testosterone and libido just staggers the mind. That any, any end of, But he, he made a go of it. He made a go of it. In other words, he used his wealth to, 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 to 
pleasure himself in terms of auditory, sensory perception, and also physical sex. There's no other way around this. He's, yeah, I, I did that. I, I had, a lot of, had a lot of chicks. The delight of the sons of man. Well, no kidding. No kidding. I mean, this is every college guy's dream until he grows a brain and recognizes that that many women is torture. Um, <laughs> you think I'm kidding. Read first, second Kings, read Chronicles. That was his downfall. It didn't end well for Solomon, the wisest man on earth, who, well, I'm, I'm done talking about that now. <laughs> Just going to get myself in trouble. This is being recorded. So, uh, so I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Okay, so sex didn't give him, give him his thing. So I'll just, I will be better than everyone else. I will excel in my field and I will be the best in my field and that will give me meaning. You know what that's about. When I came here to the University of Iowa, I came here not to be the best in terms of an academic student, but to be the best in my weight class at a particular weight in wrestling. That was the goal. Figured if I could be the best person in the country at this weight class at my time, then that would give my life meaning. I was not the best in my weight class, and so I guess I'll never know. But I do know a lot of guys who were the best and are the best, and they still don't derive meaning from that quest. For some of you, it's not athletics, but you can relate to that. It's about being the best in your field whether that field is uh, in research or that field is business. You're trying to outdo all of your competitors so that you can be the best. And by the way, just because you love Jesus and follow Jesus, and maybe you're in full-time ministry, it still does not exempt you from looking at what you do and comparing it to what other people do in their field of ministry and saying, am I better than them? Churches do it all the time. You get a bunch of guys at a pastor's conference and, and, and say, what are you running these days? What are you running these days? What do you mean, a 10K, a marathon? No, no, no. How many people attend your church? Oh, yeah, we're running about 200. We're running about 1,500. And all of a sudden, it's, it's just about outdoing one another. That, by the way, size of a church has nothing to do with spiritual health. It has nothing to do with spiritual health. It could be just that you're all a bunch of consumers and, and we're entertaining. And this is your entertainment hour. That's not healthy. But nonetheless, we can tell ourselves that that's what health is and, and justify our existence and live for that. Hopefully that's not the case. But anyway, you see that he's, becoming, he's become great, surpassed all who were before me, and also his wisdom remained with me. In other words, he's consciously testing all of these things that he's listing and saying, okay, is there meaning in that? Is there meaning in that? Is there meaning in that? So what was the outcome? The outcome Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure. Why does he say this in this part of, this, part of, the, uh, part of the, the message here? As he's concluding, he wants us to understand, listen, I didn't, I tried everything. Ah, you know, I ask a lot of questions when I preach. Sometimes I'm like, Brooks, is this wise to ask this? Um, so I won't ask it. Most, most of us, tell ourselves no, sometimes, yes? Hopefully, right? That's why I didn't ask. How many of you have never said no? I didn't want to actually see your hands go up because like, oh, people are like, no, look, stay away from that person. Solomon never said no to himself. He didn't. I, I kept my heart from nothing. Whatever my heart wanted, whatever my eyes saw, and I said, oh, you know, I want that, I'll try that. He did. He did. He wants us to understand, I tested everything. There's not, and by the way, if he was poor or middle class in terms of an economic status, you could say, well, you just didn't have enough money. Oh, no, no, I had enough money. Remember I had the running choir when I went jogging that followed me and sang to me? I had the money. Whatever I wanted, I tried. It's important for us to see that. For my heart found pleasure in all my toil. And he also wants us to know, hey, I did find pleasure in it. Duh. Of course, there were th he derived pleasure from seeking pleasure. So he did experience pleasure. And the pleasure in and of itself was the reward for all his toil. Verse 11, then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil 
I'd expended in doing it, and behold, it's all vanity. It's all a striving after the wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. The conclusion of the matter, yeah, I found pleasure, but I didn't find meaning. Finding pleasure and, and trying to find meaning in the pleasure, I caught it. It was a striving after the wind. I ran after the wind, and then I caught it. And what happens when you catch the wind? You can't catch the wind. It's not that the wind is imaginary. It's real, but you can't grab it. It doesn't last. The word vanity here, as we talked about in the first sermon, is repeated all through, I think, 35 times in Ecclesiastes. It literally means a vapor, a wisp of smoke. It's a real thing, but you can't hold it. It's there and it's gone. That's the way pleasure is. It's there and it's gone. You can't make a, ba a life, your, your life can't be based upon the acquisition of pleasure because it, it never lasts. It's there and, it's, and then it's not. It's there and then it is not. Then he takes a, a brief moment and he says, okay, in verses uh, 12 through 17, he talks a little bit about wisdom. We talked about that last week, but he makes this conclusion. He says, when I saw that there's more, uh, there is more gain in being wise than in folly, and as is there's more gain in light in darkness. So he makes one observation. It's better to be wise than a fool. So that's true. In this life, it's better to be wise, use your head, apply what you know. It's better to be wise than be a fool. Why? Um, because if you're wise and you work hard, you will be able to avoid some self-inflicted pain, some self-inflicted pain, and you might be able to enjoy some pleasure that you would not otherwise enjoy. That's true. If you're a fool, you'll do all sorts of stupid stuff, you'll inflict pain upon yourself, and there'll be less pleasure. But then he says, but ultimately it doesn't matter because both going to rot. So yeah, at the end of the day, so yes, I was wise and I applied my mind and I kept myself out of trouble, experienced more pleasure, but the idiot who went through life banging his head against the wall, you know where both of us end up? In the ground. And that's meaningless. That's meaningless. So the wisdom that he used to acquire pleasure ultimately got him some pleasure, but then he dies anyway. So there's really technically no advantage over the fool if we're still keeping with John Lennon's song. There's only sky above us. And then he also talks about toil. Toil. Work. Work. How many of you uh, were told by your parents or your guidance counselor or your teachers or your peers that college was important? Raise your hand. Why? What's the stock answer for why you have to go to college? So you can get a better job. Why technically do you need a better job? So you can make more money. Why do you need more money? So you can live a better life. You see where this is going? Why do people work? So they can acquire money. Why do they want money? So they can acquire pleasure. So they can acquire the comforts of life. What he's saying here is, listen, I examined all the work that I put into this. Because I, I worked for the same reason most people work. Not to just pay the bills. He worked so that he could acquire more pleasure. Now he's taking a look at the work that he did so that he could get the pleasure that he got. Make sense? And what was his conclusion? I hated it. All of my toil, for which I toiled under the sun... Why did I hate it? Because I'm going to die and give it to people who didn't work for it. Hate it. That just drove him nuts. Drove him nuts. Verse 22. He asked the question, so what did I get? What was my gain from all this toil beneath the sun? What's the answer? It's a rhetorical question. If it's a rhetorical question, what's the answer? Nothing. Nothing. He didn't gain anything. He doesn't have any more pleasure at the, at the end than he did at the beginning. He experienced pleasure along the way, 
But when he's old and ready to die, it doesn't matter. He's still going to rot. And so that drove him nuts to think that he worked that hard for something that can't last. And the last thing, what did he gain? Didn't gain anything. He, oh, he gained something. Anxiety and stress. For all his days are full of sorrow and his work is a vexation. Even in the night, his heart does not rest. This is vanity. How many of you are stressed out about your jobs? Anybody lose sleep over what they do? You're right there in the same boat. By the way, this is not simply a, oh, if you were only in ministry serving Jesus, you'd never have anxiety. <laughs> One year ago, I went to the doctor and had my heart tested because I could, I, my heart was beating out of my chest. I could literally feel it beating. I could feel it in my teeth at night. That's weird. <laughs> You're lying there trying to sleep and you can feel your heart going, doosh, 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 doosh. What the heck? I work out all the time. I don't smoke. I do overeat, but I work out all the time to compensate for that overeating. <laughs> I shouldn't feel my heart in my face at night. So I went, they did an EKG. There's nothing wrong with you. Is your job stressful? <laughs> I, I, I would lay around at night thinking about all the problems in people's lives that I couldn't fix. I'm sitting there at night, vexed, not resting, serving Jesus who's supposed to be my rest. You know what the reason is? It's because when the stable is full, there's lots of crap to shovel. <laughs> you people poop all the time. <laughs> yeah, and I was making it my business to try to somehow save everybody. That's not my job. That's Jesus' job. But nonetheless, I found basically... Lo and behold, Solomon's right. Solomon's right. Toil, toil is a vexing thing. You try to do something to acquire pleasure and it just, the more successful, quote unquote, you are, the more you have to worry about. The more you have to worry about. So let's pray and we'll all go home and be depressed. Now, there's, there's, <laughs> there's the last part and that is the hope. Where's the hope? The hope, he says, there's nothing better for a person to do than he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. Now stop right there. If, if you're, I read this passage the, for the first time, the first time I'd read through Ecclesiastes, trying to figure this out, it's like, well, wait a minute. You said that eating and drinking and finding pleasure is meaningless, and then you say, oh, but here's what the purpose is. There's nothing better than you should eat and drink and, 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 uh, and find enjoyment in his toil. W which is it? That's not the end of the sentence, or it's not the end of the verse. This also, I saw, is from the hand of God. Stop. Notice what he did. He suddenly stepped back, and he mentioned something that was not under the sun, but something above the sun. He stopped imagining that there's only sky above us, and he took into account that there is a God who created the heavens, he created the sky, he created the earth, and he created you, and he created me. And when he considers that reality, that greater transcendent reality, he was able to enjoy things. He was able to enjoy them. Here's uh, something from Derek Kidner in his commentary on Ecclesiastes. He calls this the paradox of hedonism. Hedonism is the pursuit of pleasure for pleasure's sake. That's what we're talking about in chapter 2, hedonism. A hedonist is someone who goes after pleasure for the sake of pleasure. The paradox of hedonism is this. The more you hunt for pleasure, the less of it you'll find. The more you hunt for pleasure, the less of it you'll find. Let me give you a practical, tangible example. Two weeks ago, um, many of you know my wife got terrible knees, multiple, multiple surgeries, two knee replacements, both failed, and she had her other knee redone a second time. Now there's nerve damage. And so we got some good news that uh, we thought we were going to have to wait for a full 
nine or 10 months or so to get the nerve damage repaired, but all of a sudden there's a cancellation. Oh, we can get you in in January. Awesome. Insurance approved. Awesome. Oh, everything aligned at once. It's like God said, open door, open door, open door. Like, oh, this was awesome. So we were in a great spirits a, a week or so ago and said, let's, let's go celebrate. So we went to Wigan Penn um, and uh, got a, uh, you know, the deep dish Chicago style pizza. We had great conversation put down our phones, we're actually looking each other in the eyes, talked about our marriage, talked about our kids, talked about life, just enjoying conversation. The pizza came, ate the pizza. Oh, this is good. Tasted better than it normally does. It's always good, but this tasted really, really good. And I didn't overeat. Some of you are like, you're lying. No, I didn't. <laughs> For me, I didn't overeat. I, I had a measured amount, and we took the rest home, and it was... It was good, and it's like, ah, oh, the conversation on the way home was great. We decided, hey, let's watch Netflix. So we, I don't remember what movie it was, but we're watching the movie, and about 10 minutes in the movie, it's like, that pizza's in the fridge. <laughs> that pizza's still in the fridge. And, and I wanted to experience the pleasure of eating. See, I, I experienced the pleasure of eating when we had dinner, when we were having conversations, and I was, I was eating to fuel my body. And I wanted to continue, I wanted that experience to just go on. And on and on. I wanted it just to keep moving, keep moving. I didn't want it to stop. So I went and I got another piece of pizza and I, and I watched the movie and I was eating it. It's like, eh, it tasted okay. Not, the molecular structure of the pizza didn't change. But my, my stomach was full, but I was putting more food into a full stomach. And the pleasure factor was diminishing. The more I ate, the less enjoyable it became. And then I went to bed, and at 3 a.m. I woke up, and I was burping pizza back up into my mouth. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't ever want to eat wig and pen again. This is terrible. <laughs> and I experienced the morning after effect. And you know what the morning after effect? It's, it's the pizza hangover, if you will. There's the literal hangover, where it's, whether it's alcohol or the, the spending hangover. It's the same thing. It's just a different substance. What's your favorite pizza? That's a metaphor. I don't care what your favorite pizza is. I didn't, I'm not asking what's your... Pepperoni, sausage. No. What is your pizza? What do you keep putting in your life thinking if you just had a little bit more or a better pizza, your life would have meaning? For some of you, it's not pizza. For some of it, it's your family. If my kids would just obey me, if my wife would just be the wife that I think that she could be, if my husband would not be the idiot that he is, but the husband that I want, then I would have more pleasure and my family would give me meaning. Here's the thing. If you place meaning in anything, you, place, you try to find meaning in anything under the sun, even if the thing is good in and of itself or neutral, it'll crush you. It'll crush you. For some of you, it's your jobs. And it's crushing you. For some of you, it's, it's the acquisition of stuff. It's crushing you. It's crushing you. Don't hear me say there's not fleeting pleasure along the way. Of course there is. That's why you keep putting it in your mouth. That's why you keep spending. That's why you keep trying to control people. If you could just make the world, universe the way you want it, you would experience more pleasure and you'd have more meaning in life. It's a lie. It's a lie. The more you seek after pleasure, the more you seek after pleasure as a source of meaning, the less of it you'll find. So what is he saying here? If you stop trying to define your life by the acquisition of pleasure, but you live your life understanding there is a God in heaven who created you, he will grant you pleasure along the way. And he will grant you enjoyment. Notice the word joy here. Uh, eat and drink and find enjoyment in all his, his toy, toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. From apart from him, who can eat or have enjoyment? Verse 26. For the one who pleases him, God will give wisdom and knowledge and joy. That's different than pleasure. Joy is kind of a lasting state of mind, a pleasure you have it one minute, and the next minute you don't. 
Joy is a baseline. Pleasure is an event. It happens and then it's gone. It happens and it's gone. God can give us joy, knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, he has given the business of gathering and collecting only to give to the one who pleases God. This also is a vanity and a striving after win. He lists two different types of people. There's the person who pleases God. And to that person, he gives wisdom, knowledge and joy. Then there's the sinner. To that person, he gives the business of acquiring and gathering and collecting only to die and turn it all over to somebody else eventually anyway, which is vanity. The person who pleases God and the sinner. That's not good news. Hebrew word for sinner means one who has fallen short. Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means that every single one of us has tried to give and find meaning for their own life apart from God. Every single one of us. There's no exception to that rule. And therefore, we are all, quote unquote, sinners. So where's the hope in that? Here's the hope in that. Jesus said to the Pharisees, John the Baptist has come eating no bread and he wasn't drinking wine and you said he had a demon. I, on the other hand, the Son of Man has come eating and drinking and you say, look, look at him. He's a glutton. He's a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by all her children. Here's the good news. Jesus is not anti-pleasure. And he's a friend of sinners. When he came, he was not the person who shunned all worldly pleasures. He came and he went to parties. He was invited to parties. Matthew held a big party, invited all of his tax collector and prostitute friends. And Jesus ate and drank with them. And he enjoyed himself. But he wasn't trying to find meaning in the eating and the drinking or the people. You know, Jesus' first miracle was? It was at a party. Do you know what he did? He turned water to wine. His first miracle at a party was to turn water to wine. He's not against you enjoying yourself. But he doesn't want you to just simply experience pleasure. He wants you and I to experience deep, rich, abiding joy. And in John chapter 15, he says, I came that you might have my joy, that my joy would be in you and that your joy would be complete. That's not simply the acquisition of pleasure. That's a lasting, abiding joy in knowing who you are and why you are. He says, I want your joy to be complete. So the first party he attended, he made wine. The last party he attended, he was the wine. And he took a cup. And when he'd given thanks, he says, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and when he'd given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. As the ushers would come forward to distribute communion, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper this morning. And we're going to eat and we're going to drink. That's a physical thing. But that physical thing, it doesn't give lasting substance. But what it represents to us. What it represents to us. So hold on to the, the, the bread. Hold on to the juice. And let me just say a few words as they're passing that out. Many of you, and rightfully so, you read the book of Ecclesiastes and you're thinking, man, this is kind of dark. He seems like a pessimist. Anybody think that Ecclesiastes is kind of a pessimistic book? It's not. You see, a pessimist is someone that has a glass 
and sees that glass if it's if it's filled in the mid mark says well that's half half empty and an optimist sees that same glass and says it's half full you say well ecclesiastes he's a pessimist he sees that as half empty. no he doesn't no he's looking at that glass and he's saying i'm not a pessimist and i'm not not an optimist i'm a realist what you're drinking isn't worth drinking and he just dumps the whole thing out and Jesus comes along and says, let me fill your cup. You've been drawn from all sorts of different wells and you always come up thirsty. You've been eating from all different sorts of sources and you're always hungry. And sometimes you get so full you want to puke and there's no joy. Stop drinking from wells that don't satisfy and let Christ fill your cup. Let him fill your cup. Drink deep of his grace, of his love, and let him give you pleasure moment by moment as you live your life for him, who is the son of God that created everything under the sun.